Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of James Hamas? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So first I'll look at the background of this case, including the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. James Hamas was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin on April 30, 1962. He went by the name Jim. His father was an accountant, and Jim had two brothers. His family moved to Springfield, Illinois in the 1970s. That's where he would go to high school. He graduated in 1980 and attended school in Iowa to become a mechanic. He gave up on that and moved back to Springfield. He enrolled in college to become an accountant. In 1984, he met a woman named Joy Johnson. They would marry on December 22 of that same year and move into an apartment in Springfield. In addition to being married to Joy, Jim had a girlfriend, somebody he dated from high school. Jim and his wife had a daughter named Amanda in 1986. Jim and his girlfriend had a daughter in 1989. Joy did not know about his relationship with this girlfriend or his other daughter. At some point, Jim and his family moved to Cincinnati, Ohio, so that Jim could work for a Coca-Cola distributor. This was his main family that moved, not his secret family. The family would move again after Jim took a job for a Pepsi distributor called G&J in Lexington, Kentucky. Joy volunteered at a local food bank and was a homemaker. Jim was making good money and eventually became the controller for the company's southern division. In 1998, Jim started embezzling money from his employer. He created a phantom bank account for an existing vendor and made payments to that account. Over the course of several years, Jim embezzled over $8.7 million. He paid estimated taxes to the IRS totaling $2.7 million. So he was stealing money, but paying taxes on what he was stealing, which would normally mean that he was not evading taxes except he failed to file tax returns for several years during his embezzlement scheme. It's hard to know which is worse, the fact that Jim embezzled millions of dollars or he helped the company distribute Pepsi. Jim started spending a lot of money on various items like motor vehicles and scuba diving trips. He would sometimes go on trips for weeks at a time. Joy was curious about where he was getting all of the money. He told her that he had invested in a software company and made a quick $100,000. This takes us to July 24, 2003. At about 10.30 p.m., Jim went for a walk alone, which he was known to do frequently. His daughter Amanda was out on a date, therefore only his wife Joy was at the house. One of Amanda's friends was curious about what happened on the date, so she drove by the family home at around 11 p.m. As she approached, she saw smoke and called for help. The residence was on fire. Firefighters found Joy in her bedroom. They took her to the hospital, but she would not survive. A fire investigator believed that an extension cord caused the fire. The insurance company blamed a ceiling fan with faulty wiring. Jim would meet a woman named Deanna Darrell, who worked for the state of Kentucky. They married in 2006 and lived in Lexington. Jim was still taking mysterious trips from time to time. He claimed he had invested in a software business which he would have to visit every so often. In reality, Jim was continuing to steal from his employer. On February 22, 2009, Jim was called to a meeting at the company headquarters in Cincinnati, Ohio. They confronted him about all the money that was missing. They found out because employees discovered canceled checks being returned from an unfamiliar bank. Jim also failed to file taxes and the IRS was investigating. Two days later, an arrest warrant was issued. When the authorities went to find Jim, they could not locate him. All they found was his cell phone and wallet on a road in Cincinnati. Investigators believed that he was on the run, but they thought that Jim wanted to make it appear as though he was the victim of foul play. Jim made his way to the Appalachian Trail, which stretches from Georgia to Maine. It's almost 2,200 miles long. Many people regularly hike on the trail, about two to three million people step foot somewhere on the trail each year. Many are just hiking for a few hours or for the day, but some stay on the trail for months. 
For example, there are people who try to hike the entire length of the trail in one season. These individuals are called through hikers. There are many reasons people do this. They may be looking for a transcendental experience. They just want something to do. They're looking for a sense of purpose or they're running from something. These hikers are part of an informal community of about 2,000 people. If somebody stays on the trail long enough, they get to know a number of other hikers. Most of the hikers come up with a trail name, which provides anonymity and adds to the mystique of the process. Jim came up with the name Bismarck. He hiked on the trail for multiple seasons. He lived in various places during the winter, including Maine and Indiana. Jim would regularly speak to people on the trail. He was quite friendly. He was also not shy about being featured in photographs. Most people who met him liked him quite a bit. There are a few reasons that he was not immediately detected as a fugitive. He did not cut his hair or beard. The culture of the thru-hikers tends to be consistent with not asking a lot of questions. And many thru-hikers were not exposed to a lot of media products, like the news. It was not unusual for the hikers to share stories. Jim participated in this. He told people that his wife had died, so he said goodbye to his two daughters and started hiking on the trail. Over time, Jim's presence on the trail became something that people described as almost legendary. In 2010, Jim met a woman named Terry Hanavan, who went by the name Hopper. By 2011, they had formed a romantic relationship. Jim's luck ran out in 2014 when a rerun of the episode American Greed featuring him was aired. One of the through hikers named Hayden Kroom recognized Jim as Bismarck and contacted the authorities. The authorities caught up with Jim on May 16, 2015 at a bed and breakfast in Damascus, Virginia. He was arrested without incident. He pleaded guilty in October of 2015 and was sentenced to eight years in prison. Now moving to my analysis. Criminals who embezzle money often have substance use and or gambling problems. Jim did not have either. His personality was described as overbearing, larger than life, inauthentically gregarious, and explosive. When Jim was around, everybody knew it. He became the center of attention and dominated conversations. When he was on the Appalachian Trail, Jim dialed back his extroversion a few notches. He attempted to express more typical personality traits in an effort to fit in. He wasn't looking to make waves. He didn't want people to remember him. However, Jim was unable or unwilling to rein in his personality traits enough to fly under the radar. He was more restrained, but still charismatic, excitement-seeking, and memorable. Jim embezzled money over the course of 21 years, from 1998 to 2009. Before he was confronted by his employer, Jim had been conducting research on the internet about how to disappear. It seems as though his employer caught on before Jim expected. Jim was willing to walk away from his second wife and his daughter. The authorities suspect that Jim may have been involved in the death of his first wife, but they have been unable to build a case. No accelerant was used in that fire, which doesn't mean that Jim didn't do it, but it does reduce the likelihood. Leaving everyone behind points to Jim only thinking of himself. This isn't particularly surprising given the description of Jim's personality. Many of the characteristics appear to align with grandiose narcissism. People found him to be extroverted, self-centered, charismatic, bombastic, obnoxious, and having a sense of entitlement. What is surprising in this case is his failure to have an escape plan. Even though he was discovered earlier than he expected, he went for years without being caught, again spending much of that time on the Appalachian Trail. Why didn't he leave the country? Why did he adopt such a prominent role on the Appalachian Trail? It's almost like he was just wandering. He really didn't have a strategy. Maybe his arrogance led him to believe he would never be caught. I find it interesting that Jim selected the trail name Bismarck. Who knows why he did it, but one famous Bismarck is the German battleship. In the end, Jim and Bismarck shared the same fate. They both sank. In addition, both went out in a blaze of glory and cemented a place in history. Maybe that's all Jim wanted. Maybe he was okay with getting caught because he desired the full credit for his incredible 21-year embezzlement scheme. What lessons can we learn from this case? I think one of the most remarkable features of this case is how 
the hikers who encountered Jim had no idea about his past. They weren't even suspicious. One of the hikers he became close with was a law enforcement officer who had experience chasing similar types of criminals. That hiker would say that he had no idea. Jim's story was completely believable. I think this really speaks to how individuals with narcissistic characteristics can believe their own lies or almost believe them. They engage in self-deception. Jim was highly convincing because he either believed his own lies or felt as though he deserved for those lies to be true. At some point, the truth simply fails to matter to these individuals. They create their own truth, their own reality, and then unite with that new reality along with the people they are deceiving. Those are my thoughts on the case of James Hammes. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be as intriguing as an embezzling Pepsi distributor. Thanks for watching.